Hi everybody, uh, so um, my name's Carl, I'm a research paramedic at North East Ambulance Service and the um, chief investigator for this um, arc for your study, um, exploring um, social deprivation um, and bystander CPR and the rise in health inequality that derives from that. Um, so, um, much the same as the last project, we are very much a collaboration of um, academic and clinical expertise from across the region. Um, so we have quite an established uh, research team and um, I would just like to acknowledge everybody um, who is on there and my colleagues Steph and uh, Laura are in the room as well. So if there are any questions at the end, I'm sure they'll be able to, um, to help with those. Um, and we had a, a quite a large pace um, element as well to our study, which has been very, very important um, from the conception of the study to where we are now um, in trying to disseminate the, um, the research findings. So our study is actually complete now. Um, it's quite timely that I'm here today talking about this research. Um, the first output from our study was published yesterday, which we're all quite pleased about. Um, so as I say, it's very timely that I'm here today to um, explain a little bit more about our project. So how did our project actually all begin? So in 2019, there were two academic papers published that made the association between um, low rates of bystander CPR and social deprivation. And those studies used um, registry data collected from every single ambulance service who attended every single cardiac arrest in England and Wales. And those, as I say, the association was made between um, low levels, uh, so, sorry, high levels of bystander high levels of social deprivation and low levels of um, of bystander CPR but no attempt was made to try and explain that um, and to be fair it was beyond the remit of those um, of those papers to do that and we know that bystander CPR is really really important so bystander CPR is the provision of CPR um, before the arrival of any emergency medical services and we know that um, for every 30 patients who receive bystander CPR one additional life would be saved so the potential is really really um the potential is there to make a big impact um on um on the survival rate so survival rates at the moment currently um in the uk are about 78 percent um the best performing ambulance service is about 12 percent which is in london um which but um those survival rates really really fall way short of um other exemplars across the um across the world um, there's um, areas of Denmark and um, also Kings County in Seattle are all, always held up as exemplars of, um, of significant improvements in survival from cardiac arrest. And that's primarily because they've invested in really um, large, significant programmes to engage members of the public in, um, um, in delivering bystander CPR. So in those two papers that I've already mentioned, um, these two maps were um, were published and highlighted. So the first map shows um, what is described as a hotspot. So a hotspot is a postcode district that has high incidence of out of hospital cardiac arrest, but low incidence, uh, but low um, rates of bystander CPR. And as you can see, although there are other uh, postcode districts um, across England, there's a big collection in our region. Um, the other map shows um, social deprivation as mapped using the IMD. And again, as you can see, there is a, um, a big collection of postcode districts in our region that suffers from um, high levels of social deprivation. So in the face of it, it did look like there was a correlation between the two. So we thought, um, as an ambulance service, we are um, best placed to look at this and try and um, move the evidence forward, try and move policy forward, um, and trying to explain this a little bit further. And actually, we thought if anybody should be doing this, then it should be ourselves. So what did we actually do? So we designed a, um, a mixed method study. Um, the first element was a questionnaire. Uh, the questionnaire started off as a derivation of the uh, Restart Heart survey from 2019, but it was very much tailored to, um, to what we wanted to find. Um, the the, um, the survey instrument was um, developed and piloted um, within our region um, and as I say um, was quite different to the Restart of Heart um, survey um, at the end. And then the 
intention was to deliver the, uh, the survey across um, postcode districts of varying social deprivation across North East and North Cumbria. And then the intention was to invite a certain number of um, respondents back to interview as well to discuss their their question, their question responses in a little bit more depth and try and add some quality of context to that. So what did we find? So just move that on. So what did we find? So 601 participants took part in the questionnaire and that was, um, as I say, across postcode districts right across North East England and North Cumbria. And 20 of those participants were invited back to interview and they, they took part in a one hour interview um, with ourselves, as I say, to discuss their, uh, their, their responses and their perceptions um, a little bit further. Um, just quickly as well, um, I'll just dot back a little bit. The survey was, um, was designed to collect people's responses um, regarding bystander CPR with four main domains of interest. So that was experience of CPR and use of a public access defibrillator. So from here on forward, I'll just call that a pad rather than keep on saying that uh, phrase all the time. Um, it was knowledge of CPR and defibrillation, their willingness to perform um, CPR and use a pad, and their self-reported competency and competence to deliver um, bystander CPR and use a pad. So what did we find? So in general, we found uh, a lack of awareness from all things associated with resuscitation and cardiac arrest. So um, people didn't understand the terminology that was used around it. Um, there was misconceptions about the terminology. People confused a cardiac arrest with an MI or a stroke or even a collapse or a seizure sometimes. Um, people didn't understand the symptoms. People didn't understand, the, um, people didn't understand why CPR was being delivered and the consequences of not receiving bystander CPR. And that was irrespective of socioeconomic status um, and or social deprivation. So some of the main findings that we did find was associated with age. So increased age was associated with all aspects of a, of a general unwillingness to help. So in the survey, we asked participants if they would be willing um, to call 999, if they would be willing to follow call taker advice, and then if they would be willing to help a family member, um, somebody who was known to them, i.e. a stranger or a, uh, a neighbor or a work colleague, and also a stranger. An increased age was associated with a lack of willingness to help anybody. And that's really problematic because most cardiac arrests occur in the home. About 80% um, occur at home. Most are witnessed by, um, by spouses and increased age is, is associated with an increased risk of cardiac arrest. And therefore, by definition, um, if you are going to have a cardiac arrest, you're going to have it at home witnessed by a spouse. And if they're not willing to help, then that is, that is really problematic um, regarding outcomes. The next um, main finding was a disparity between gender. So we know that women are less likely to receive bystander CPR, but we also found that women were less likely to, de to, to deliver bystander CPR as well. Um, so in our study, women were much, likely, much, much less likely to report being comfortable delivering bystander CPR and we don't really understand why um, that remains to be um, remains to be sort of explored a little bit more and these are some of the quotes that women said um, during the interviews and as you can see um, there is a, a, a general um, lack of confidence in some of the words that are used and some of the phrases and, and a lot of confusion um, regarding what CPR is and, and why it should be um, and why it's so important. So ethnicity was also a really important factor. Um, so ethnicity, um, other, than, um, other than white British, was significantly associated with a lack of knowledge regarding CPR and also um, a lack of knowledge regarding um, the use of a pad. So um, participants who were non-white British accounted for only 2% of our study population which we do think is probably representative of the northeast of England, but um, they accounted for 12% of people who didn't understand what CPR was for and 10% of people who didn't understand what a pad was for. Thanks. 
Um, sorry, I'll just push on a little bit. I've only got a minute left, apparently. Um, so these next three um, aspects um, of social deprivation, education and income um, in, intersect really quite nicely. Um, so those from deprived areas, um, sorry, from uh, least deprived areas were less likely to report comfort. So if you think of that the opposite way, more deprived areas were more likely to be comfortable um, delivering CPR. And that might well be because they've, um, they've got first-hand experience of it, um, because we know that cardiac arrest is more likely to occur in deprived postcode districts. Uh, regarding education, higher education was associated with an increased knowledge of what, um, of what a PAD was for, and also um, with an increased knowledge of being able to recognise if somebody was having a cardiac arrest. Um, increased knowledge, increased education was also associated with a desire for more information regarding where to find um, CPR training and income. So individuals with increased income were more likely to follow advice and uh, they were more likely to report comfort using a pad. So as I said before, these three, um, these three sort of characteristics um, intersect quite nicely and the argument would, would probably be if you um, have a better job when you have more income then you you are probably more um, you are probably better educated and have a good understanding of the health co health consequences associated with cardiac arrest and with not delivering by standard CPR so the big um, question is so what so markers of social economic status and or deprivation um, by the, by the IMD um, are a really, really poor indicator of, of somebody's willingness, um, understanding, perception and comfort to deliver bystander CPR. And the factors that dictate whether or not somebody will deliver bystander CPR lie well beyond that. And as policymakers and um, as people, as researchers delivering interventions to try and correct the health inequality that, that lies within that, we need to really take that into consideration and try and think beyond um, capturing people to take part in bystander CPR interventions by just targeting them through their socio socioeconomic status. Um, and, and, that's, and that's where we are now at the moment, really. Um, we are trying to get our, um, get our research into policy and into practice by trying to target um, some, of the, some of the groups that have been highlighted in our study as um, as requiring that intervention in a much more nuanced and uh, focused way.